So this morning, I am joined by Brother Luke Hahn from Iowa, and we're going to do a kind of follow-up video to the testimony that we put up of Luke's from on April 4th of 2018. And since April of 2018, the testimony has gotten around 7,000 comments with different people asking a number of different questions. Uh, and we want to give Luke an opportunity to respond to some of those questions because different questions indicate uh, a lack of understanding of what the scriptures teach on certain matters. And we want to help people to really know what does God say in his word. And we want, you know, we, we don't just put up testimonies in order for people to be encouraged, but we want to guide them to the truth of God's word. And so Luke is joining me this morning, and we've got some questions. We've, we've prayed and asked for God's help, and we're going to dive right in to these questions. So good morning, Luke. Glad to have you. Yes, good morning. Glad to be here. Thanks, James. So one of the things that is, was commented on again and again in the comment section is people who said, God did not cause your accident in trial. People were bothered by the fact that even the way we titled it, God had to strip you of everything. So we're pointing to the fact that God was involved in stripping you of everything. And a lot of professing Christians, they did not like that. What would be some things that you could clarify or say to those individuals? It is a thought because, you know, we want, we want to believe that God is for our good. And if God's for our good, you know, why would he do things that we see as bad? You know, so a lot of the references went to Job. Um, and they would even say referencing Job potentially that, you know, that God is for your good. God only causes good. God does not cause harm. God does not, uh, he's not involved in anything that is bad or potentially viewed as sinful even. So I, in a sense, I can agree, you know, that the scriptures, the scriptures do not say that God caused my accident because God is not the author of sin. But the scriptures are very clear that God permitted it. You know, we look at Job, we look at Job's life, and time and time again, what did Satan do? Satan had to go to the Lord, and he had to say, this is a righteous man. You know, he had to even admit, this is a righteous man. You know, if you touch his family, or if you touch his wealth, um, and eventually if you touch even his body, then he will curse you. And what did the Lord say? He said, behold, he is in your hand. Only spare his life. So again and again, we see that God is involved in these things. And he's not carrying out the necessarily the, the, the duty or the task at hand, maybe you want to call it. But he is involved. He's there. He's not... You know, it's not just some random event. You know, the Lord is, uh, he's involved and it's under his knowledge. Um, you know, we look, I can give you several verses here. You know, if we're going to trust God as who he is, you know, there's a scripture in Genesis 18, 25 says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? If we're believing that, if we're believing the scriptures, then we're believing that God is doing right. He's doing good for us. Um, I think of Romans 8, or excuse me, Romans 9.20. It says, what, will what is molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay? We are the created, not the creator. Yeah. The Lord has the right to do with us what he wills. Yeah. You know, I referenced it in my testimony, I believe. One of my favorite verses is Exodus 4.11, I believe it is. It says, you know, who has made the deaf, the mute, the blind, the dumb? Is it not I, the Lord? And the scriptures are very clear. God is sovereign over all things, all things. Satan is not sovereign over it. I'm not sovereign over it. James is not. You are not. God is sovereign over all things. 
And if we're trusting and believing that, as we should be, as the scriptures teach, then we must understand that God is involved in it. He's there. You know, he's not the author of sin. You know, he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. We know God is good, but good involves all of his attributes. And that involves his drawing of a sinner. That involves his, you know, his working in the life of a Christian. Uh, maybe it, whether it be for discipline or whether it be just to draw us closer to himself. But there is purpose in it. So it's not, again, it's not just a random events. And it's not that God's sitting back saying, well, I hope nothing bad happens to Luke. You know, because I'm not in control. I hope Satan doesn't go too far. I hope the world doesn't go too far, man. God is involved in all things. And we must believe that. So I guess that's, you know, and we can see suffering comes at different points in our lives. You know, for me, what is, you know, what the reason I'm, you know, people are asking these questions because I'm in a wheelchair. That happened before I became a Christian. Some people are, they're going to see the bulk of their suffering maybe before they are a Christian. What that's doing is the Lord's using that. He's saying, look at yourself. You have no power. You're dust. Look at me. Look unto me. I'll be saved. All the ends of the earth. So whatever suffering or, you know, problems, whatever you want to call it, that happens prior to your conversion, it's God working to move you toward himself. And then when suffering happens post-conversion or after you're saved, born again, you've got a regenerated heart, that suffering causes us, to, again, to see that we're reliant upon the Lord. We need him. You know, maybe pride is settled in. Maybe not even pride. Maybe it's just a sense of, you know, we just need a fresh revelation of who Christ is. And sometimes that is, you know, that causes us to look to Christ. I was thinking this morning, even about this question a little bit, and I was thinking about the Philippian jailer. Hmm. You know, we look at what happened to him. Yeah. You know, he nearly committed suicide. You know, he had a suffering come upon him. The, the walls are shaken. The prisoners are free. You know, he's no doubt, he's not going to get fired. He's probably going to get worse. Mm. The Lord used that for his good. So would we say, you know, God had no, God had no, you know, involvement in that. If we believe that, then we say God had no involvement in his salvation. Mm. And that's incorrect thinking. Mm. It really is. So God uses all things, that, you know, God says, um, scriptures say God works all things together for good for those that love him. And even if, even if it's causing us to get to that point to where we do love him, it's all of God. Hmm. That's a good point. I haven't thought of that before, that the jailer, the earthquake and all of that, yeah, that was definitely used for good to yeah. put him in a state where he was really asking, what must I do to be saved? Yes. yes. And even just seeing the Christian's response that they stayed yeah. in the jail, that was a yeah. powerful testimony yeah the next kind of question that you wanted to hit on some and maybe you just hit on it some there was you know what is the purpose of your pain and suffering yeah um i mean would you choose to be in a wheelchair and have chronic pain are you happy that you have that yeah i'm not thrilled about it every day james right um i can even tell you you know the last few months they've been hard for me because I've got, I found out that I've got just a uh, low back issue, a very common thing. But for the last few months, I've, I can honestly say I've struggled and I've found myself in situations where I'm saying, why does it have to be like this? You know, why, you know, and, and then I have to, I have to, again, come back to the Lord and say, this is of you. There's a purpose in this. It's not in vain. Yeah. Would I, again, back to your question, would I choose this? No, of course not. The answer is no. Um, you know, I don't enjoy suffering or pain any more than anybody else. The difference is I see God's purpose in it. So many people don't see God's purpose in it, or they think it's just, again, random, or it's just God, you know, 
punishing them for something. And that's not the case. You know, I see the effect that me being in a chair has had on my life. I know how it's worked in my heart. I know how proud I was, how proud I am still, and how much more proud I'd be if I was standing up. You know, then I could, I could display some of, you know, just display more pride even in a sense. But, and I see God's purpose in things. You know, and I look at my life and I say, I'm in a chair. This has provided me so many opportunities to share the truth of God's word with people, to share the gospel with people, to see people converted. That's worth it. In my mind, that is worth every ounce of this suffering. You know, we read James 1, 2, verse 2 and 3. And listen to this. This isn't always easy to do. I'll confess it. But count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. To you, that know, to you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Hmm. We want steadfastness. Yeah. If, if everything's perfect, everything's, you know, if I was guaranteed that once I was converted, I'm going to walk again. I'm going to have no back pain. I'm going to have the perfect marriage, the perfect kids. I'm going to have a great job or a great ministry. I'm going to, if all these things are guaranteed perfection, what's what's the temptation there i don't need the lord everything's going well he you know maybe he gave it to me once and now everything's fine yeah, but that's not that's not how it works unfortunately you know in our minds that's what we desire so often we desire that but it's not reality now even if the lord were to you know were to give me my legs and say you know here walk that doesn't take away the pain of you know all the other things my you know, I struggle with, um, you know, maybe I struggle with headaches or maybe, you know, you could struggle with any number of things. You may struggle with certain sin. You may struggle with family relationships. You may struggle with your church. You, may, you know, there's just so many things you can struggle with. It's not all going away. It just isn't. And then listen to this. Philippians 3.10. Absolutely incredible verse. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. So that's what we want. We want to know him. We want to know the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Hmm. That verse doesn't get used very often by a lot of the ministries that are telling us to, you know, have enough faith or, you know, read your Bible enough. It says right there, we must share in his sufferings, becoming like him. The Christian life is, we want sanctification. We want that road of, you know, putting to death the deeds of the flesh, you know, seeing sin crushed in our lives, and that upward, gradual Christ-likeness about ourselves. And if we're going to see that, we know that the Lord sometimes uses suffering. We look at what the Lord Jesus suffered, and we can share, what does it say, you know, that we may fill up what is lacking. You know, in our own lives, we often see and, and, and encounter suffering of some sort. It doesn't even have to be pain or paralysis. It can be, you know, there's people out there suffering with far, far worse things than I am. But there's purpose in it. It can cause us to become more like him. And that's you know, that's what we desire as a Christian. And I desire for any of you professing Christians that you become like him, even if it involves suffering. Now, another comment that came up many, many times is basically people believing that God, uh, God can easily heal you right now in a moment, um, or wondering if you know if God is good, why doesn't He heal you? If God can heal and He's good, then why doesn't He heal you? Why aren't you healed right now? Yeah, I've been asked that personally several times. You know, why, if God is good and you say he's good, why doesn't he heal you? Well, and what I often ask them is, you know, who's defining good here? Is that your definition of good or my definition of good or God's definition of good? Yeah. 
And when we look at that question, who's defining good? I'm trusting that God has my best interest in mind. Me personally, I'm trusting that. And if that means I'm confined to a wheelchair with some chronic back pain for 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, until I die, if it causes me through that pain and suffering to, as we just talked about, to become like him, if that's what's needed in my life for sanctification, to grow in holiness, to see that and constantly be a reminder to me that this world is passing, it's fading away. You know, there's pain and suffering in this world. I feel it. I see it. Every morning I get out of bed and I see this world is fallen and broken. I can get up and I can say, Lord, thank you for the day. Thank you for the day. Thank you that, it, that I even have breath in my lungs, that I can share your goodness with my children. That's what we wake up for. It's not to wake up and say, well, God didn't heal me. He's not good. No. We want to be Christ-like. So if for me, if that's what I need to have as a reminder that this world is broken, fallen, and one day I will have physical healing. Maybe it is in this life. God is able. But maybe it's not until I pass unto death and there in perfection. You know, then I walk the streets of gold. But right now, whatever it takes, you know, whatever it takes now, we want to be asking God to do that in our lives help us to fix our eyes on Christ, mm -hmm. fix our eyes on Christ and watch the things of the world grow darker and dimmer. You know, and I, that's not to say if the Lord, you know, if the Lord gave me healing and all of a sudden I could walk tomorrow, could that happen? I absolutely believe it could happen. But is that, is that the primary thing in my life now? No, it's not. And the reason it's not is because I don't want to have this misconceived thought process that, you know, I have to have healing in my body or healing physically to see that God is who he says he is. Mm -hmm. So good, good to me, and I hope good to you, is being content and being content in all things, as Paul says, being content in the circumstances we have so that we might gain Christ. We might see Christ in a clearer way and we might see the world for what it is. You know, a sinful, broken world that's truly passing away. So God is good. He absolutely is good. Um. Let me read this. 2 Corinthians 4.17 For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. That's what I want. Yeah. An eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. What does that mean? It tells me that this momentary affliction it's okay to pray that God, would you heal me? Would you give me, um, would you give me even just the grace to bear it? And we know Paul prayed three times to have the thorn, the thorn removed from his flesh. God didn't grant it. So it's not always granted, but we do know that it's light and momentary. I don't care how miserable I might feel one day. I can still get through the day with great peace knowing that it's preparing for me an eternal weight of glory. That's how we get through life with joy, knowing that this is momentary. And then second Corinthians one, eight, and nine, this is Paul speaking for, we do not want you to be unaware brothers of the affliction we experienced in Asia. They experienced severe affliction for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Reading some of these comments, I can see many of you have despaired of life itself. 
that's a, that's a scary place to be. And pain is real. Suffering is real. But listen, as he carries on, indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. Okay, now listen. Here's the great, one of the great buts in the scriptures. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Hmm. Again, we must see that there's purpose in this. It's causing us to go to Christ, to run to Christ. If we didn't have prayer, you know, we have, you know, we have no hope. We need Christ, and he allows us to come to him, to pray to him, to cast our anxieties upon him, to put our cares upon him. And when we do that, we're, again, we're relying on Christ. You know, we don't wake up and take a breath without the Lord's involvement. You know, he gives us the breath in our lungs. He gives us the food we eat, the clothes we wear all of it and he promises to care for us but sometimes we again we have this misguided thought that what we feel is best is what is best Mm -hmm. in in reality it's what god knows is best and what how he's working in our lives to um to just work salvation in us yeah that's a good point i mean there's so many people who are you know in perfect health supposedly physically and they might think i have it good but the fact is they're dead spiritually and they have the worst final end in eternity and hell coming and so whatever happens to wake them up to see their need of salvation it's it's worth it in the end absolutely to perishing absolutely so some you know as far as this whole topic of miracles and, and healing a lot of the comments seem to to have this idea of like there's some formula that if you just did this, Luke, and even I, I checked the comments, and in the last 24 hours, someone said, if you read the Bible three times a day, like you take medicine uh, until you are healed. And so many comments had something similar. It's like, do this, and it's going to guarantee God's going to heal you. What would you say to these individuals? Um, yeah, that's a a very rampant theology, we might say. I would say that that's it's not scriptural. Yeah, we don't see that in the scriptures anywhere. You know, there is no A plus B equals healing. There is scriptures. I will I will agree one hundred percent that God is able to heal. We see that in the scriptures. We see that Jesus had compassion and he healed numerous, numerous people of physical ailments. And I could give you five examples quickly. I'm sure you could as well. Where the Lord simply touches and he does heal. But nowhere in the scriptures do we see Jesus send someone away and say, if you do this and do this and do this, you know, if you read your Bible, I mean, there's just, there's no formula out there. If there was, don't you think we would see a lot more people just, you know, healing? Because it's not works-based. Again, God works in his, his way. His, his ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. Yeah. You know, there is no, there is no method to this. Um it's dangerous too, because what happens is it makes, it can make an idol of your health. Um, or if not your health, your situation, you know, your marriage or your, um, whatever it might be. If I read my Bible enough, or if I pray enough, or if I, you know, you know, we try and we try and do it in our own strength. You know, I like the example I've heard used of, you know, a person laying on their back, grabbing their belt and trying to pull themselves up. Mm. That's what we're trying to do. If we think that we can sit down and we can, in our human finite minds, determine how am I going to get myself healed? Because if it's not in scripture, that's exactly what we're doing. If it's in scripture, then we can go with it. We can take the promises of God and we can run with them. So, and I, again, I, I really want to, 
I want to emphasize the point that what is most important in your life? Yeah. You know, is the most important thing in your life to see Christ, to know your sins forgiven? You know, even the, you know, it just comes to mind the disciples, you know, they came back to Jesus and they were excited about, you know, the miracles and the things that they had seen. And what did he say? He said, rejoice not in that, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Yeah. That's what we rejoice in. That's what we revel in. That's what we, we carry on for. It's if my, only goal was to walk again. I could, I could spend my entire day reading the Bible and then all night praying. But if God doesn't, if God doesn't do it, it's not going to happen. I can't work it up. Mm -hmm. And there's no promise that tells me if I do that, <clears throat> that if I do that, that it's going to happen. You know, some might say, well, you have the wrong kind of faith. Mm. Well, or they might say you don't have enough faith. If you had enough faith, you'd be healed. Show me that in the scripture. It's not there. You know, what we look at and when we think of faith, yeah, you know, we, we have little faith. We are people of little faith. You know, regardless, you can look at someone and might say, oh, my, they have great faith. They have they have the same simple faith that we do. We're looking mm -hmm. unto God. We're looking unto God to do what he deems best. You know, I think of this verse. I wrote this verse down because. And this isn't everyone's situation, but, you know, listen to Mark 945. This is Jesus words. He says, and if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of people out there that think they're on the road to heaven. And they believe they even may be on the road to heaven because they want the blessings today. They want the blessings of health. You know, they want healing of whether I don't care if it's cancer or it's a headache or it's you know, a stubbed toe. They want those physical healings. Or they may want wealth. We see that all the time, too. God wants you wealthy. God wants you to have a comfortable life. You know, again, we don't see that in the Scripture. We just don't see that in the Scripture. You know, again, we go back to that verse we just shared a little bit ago, that, that we may share in his sufferings. There's just no... We put, I, I just feel like we put too much emphasis on healing. Yeah. God often has, you know, we all have a lot to take. We all have a cross to carry. For some, I, I'm not saying every Christian is going to have suffering. That's not true. I mean, some people, some Christians will walk through the life with wonderful bodies. They'll go right to the grave with, with very good health. But for some of us, a portion of our cross is physical ailment. It just is because it produces in us Christ likeness. So have I prayed and asked God to heal me? I have, I have. Am I going to stop praying that God might heal me? No. And the reason is because it's not because I have this grand desire to walk or this grand desire to be pain free, but my desire is Lord, and I'll share this with you, James. I shared just with a brother the other day. I've asked for prayer that the Lord would just give me, just give me the ability to not have to think about my pain. Mm -hmm. It does. It What it does so often, James, is it, it causes my thought life to say, you know, I'm in pain. You know, it just, it, it steals a lot of my thought life. Mm -hmm. I want to take every thought captive. I want to be able to continually think on eternal things, think on the scriptures, meditate. I want to be able to be praying without ceasing. You know, have a have a thought life of prayer. But oftentimes, I'm thinking about my oh, my back hurts. I need to, you know, there's just there is these thoughts that, and they're not sinful thoughts. It's just reality. Hmm. But I ask the Lord, Lord, would you give me the ability to just 
continually think on Christ. Give me the ability to, to truly pray without ceasing. You know, in my, the way I see that is to have a, a mindset of, you know, whatever my, you know, whether I'm thinking about my children, whether I'm thinking about my wife, you know, the church, um, a scripture that I'm trying to memorize or meditate on, to be able to just constantly have my mind fixed on those things. For me, that would be a greater win than if I could walk. Hmm. You know, if I could walk, great. I could, you know, I could maybe be a little more handy. I could carry my children. I could, you know, hug my wife standing up. Those are things I would like to do. But are they the most important things? They're not. They're really not. So, hmm. seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Do not be anxious for tomorrow. If I'm sitting here dwelling all day, is tomorrow going to be the day I walk? I'm wasting a lot of time. Instead, I want to seek the kingdom of God. I want to see souls saved. I want to see, you know, I want to see my children taught. I want to see the church flourish. Hmm. And I want to see others grow in Christ. Hmm. And that is far more important. Amen. Yeah, it's interesting. Like you referred to Mark 9. And I realize, you know, Jesus isn't saying literally cut, you know, yeah. both your feet off, but it's, it's like there are things in people's lives that they're refusing to forsake, to follow Christ. Yes. Like the rich young ruler who had that one thing and, and ultimately it appears went to hell yeah. over these riches. I mean, he had good health apparently. Uh, and he had riches, he had all these things, but what does it yeah. profit a man if he gains the whole world and Lose loses soul. his soul? And so, yes. you know, having a right, right perspective, because it is better if I actually physically am lame in this life and yes. I have Christ and go to heaven, then I'm in great health and yeah. perish in my pride. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, another thing that constantly came up in the comment section is people were wondering why you left the Catholic Church. And in some of the comments, it sounded like people thought you were maybe still Catholic. And, you know, in the, in the video, you shared about this because growing up, your parents initially were in a Catholic Church. Yeah. And so, you know, as as YouTube has put, put the testimony as like a suggested video, a lot of random people have ran into it because it has, you know, the term God in the title most likely. Yeah. So you got all sorts of different people running into it. And so what if some of them say they did watch this follow-up video and uh, they really, they're shocked that you would leave the Catholic church. They view Catholicism as right and true. Um, what would you say are some of the primary reasons or what would you say to someone who's a Catholic if, if they were on yeah. this call with us right now? Yeah, well, the Catholic church, and I want to specify, you know, when I say the Catholic church, I mean the Roman Catholic church. So the Roman Catholic church there, I'm in a, I'm in an area here in Iowa that is really predominantly Catholic and I'm surrounded by Catholics. My, Parents were converted out of Catholicism, and I've seen a lot of the people I know have, have come out of Catholicism. And even a Bible study that I'm leading right now through work, the majority of them are Catholic. And the reason they're seeking is because they're finding no answers in the Catholic Church. You know, they have, they're just lost and hopeless in the Catholic Church. And a lot of the reasons are is because, one, it's the, they teach blatant opposition to what the Bible says. And I can give you just a couple examples here. Um, the first one being, uh, let's read Matthew 23, verse 9. It says, And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. And what do we hear the Catholic Church do? Father so-and-so, father so-and-so. Um, I need to be blessed by father so-and-so. Father so-and-so is doing confession. I need my sins forgiven. And they go to a man. Hmm. They're going to a man. It starts you know, at the Pope, and it just comes down to, you know, these local congregations. In the Catholic Church, we see it, we see it coming apart in many ways. Um, 
So it seems the Lord is working to break up some of that that false and heretical teaching. You know, but we have scripture right there that says, call no man your father on earth. And yet they go every Sunday or Saturday night and they go to their catechisms and these things and they call a man their father when in reality they have one father who is in heaven. You know, that is blatant opposition to the scripture. Another one. Let's listen to this. Romans 6, 3 through 4. Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. I was sprinkled as an infant. You know, the, the father, as, you, as they call him, you know, my parents were Catholic. You know, they had me baptized. I don't remember. I don't have any idea how old it is. Um, I know I was an infant, but they sprinkle water on you. And that's a sacrament that you know, you're baptized into God's family. They would believe in. There's nowhere in the Bible that teaches that. You know, if you want to sprinkle a baby, that's fine, but it's doing no good whatsoever. It's not regenerating a heart. It's not giving them, you know, as the end of the scripture says, newness of life. The Bible teaches baptism by immersion, and that baptism by immersion is an outward sign or an ordinance that is for the Christian. It's for one that is already converted, has given their life to Christ, has repented of their sin, and is walking in newness of life and has, you know, has proven fruit of that. It's not for the, the infant or the, the child or whoever it might be to just be sprinkled. It's, it's an outward sign. It's, it gives no, no profit in itself. There's no profit in itself. It's simply an outward sign. So, Again, you know, we see so many uh, Roman Catholics that have been sprinkled and they're trying to hold on to that. Well, I was baptized as an infant. I hope that's enough. Mm. I hope that's enough. When in reality, even they in their heart know that it's not. Mm. Um, one other one, I'll give you one last one here. Um, just in opposition to the scriptures, Hebrews 10, 11 through 14 says, and every priest stands daily at his service. So think of the Catholic Church here. Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. That's glorious, James. Yeah. And we read that and we say, you know, this, this transubstantiation, transubstantiation where they believe that they're turning this, you know, this wafer into Christ and they do it daily. They do it daily in hopes that, you know, that there's some merit in that and they're taking, you know, ingesting the body of Christ. When in reality, we have a God who became man, came into this world, you know, a virgin birth, which again, even that is unexplainable. And then he lives this perfect life. And then he's crucified. And he willingly stays on that cross to endure the wrath of God so that for the joy set before him, we might be saved. Again, we see, even, you know, my suffering, all of this, your suffering, there's purpose in it all, you know, from before the foundation of the world until now, God had a plan mm -hmm. and Christ Jesus carried it out, carried it out on the cross. And he made that one time sacrifice that we might be reconciled to God. And he's sitting in heaven on the right hand of the father now interceding for us, even for the lost, for those that are going to come to Christ, for those of us that are that are on the road to eternal glory. He's there praying for us and he's doing that because he loved us. It's not that priest 
in the Roman Catholic Church, he's doing no service whatsoever. He's doing no service to God, and he's doing no service to the people that are that are coming to him and calling him father or pope or bishop or whatever it might be. There's no merit in that whatsoever. Hmm. It's simply Christ and his finished work on the cross. Hmm. Um, yeah, and it's amazing just yeah them falling into these different old testament ideas even and wanting to yeah wrong not see the fullness of what we have in in the new testament yeah and um yeah. and what christ has done and so yeah, and there's such a promotion of works based salvation yeah yeah it leaves people hopeless you know it leaves people absolutely hopeless you know I, isaiah 64 6 we've all become like one who's unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. The Roman Catholic that has God working in his life and has any, any reality in his life of, of who they truly are, their sin, they feel that and they know it. And that's when they start seeking and they say, God, what is the purpose of this life? Why am I here? Why can't I overcome any sin? Why do I feel the same when I go into confession and then or feel the same when I come out of confession as when I went in? It's because man cannot forgive or absolve sin. Only God can do it through Christ Jesus. Hmm. You know, Ephesians 2 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. I don't care how much money you give to the Catholic church. I don't care how many times you go to confession. I don't care if you've been, you know, baptized, you've gone through, um, you know, every sacrament. I don't even know how many sacraments there are anymore, but there's quite a few. You can do every one of them. If you're not relying on Christ and trusting in his shed blood for your sin, it's absolutely fruitless and you will end up in hell. Hmm. Um, I know there's a, new kind of wave of Catholics that they make a big deal out of, well, works really, works really matter. I mean, look at all these evangelicals and these Baptists are living in sin. They're saying they're Christians and here they're slaves of their sin. Yeah. So Catholics will tend to use that against Protestants because of yeah. all of the hypocrisy of people yeah. living in sin. And And what would you say to that? Do, I mean, you just read Romans six. Do we continue yeah. in sin that grace may abound? Well, no, we don't. No. Yeah. Well, they're correct in some sense. There is so much hypocrisy. There are so many that um, profess they are a Christian, but it's because they don't have a regenerated heart. There is, you know, we think of Matthew 7. How many are going to say, Lord, Lord, did we not you know, do this? Did we not prophesy? Did we not do good works? And at the end, they'll hear the Lord say, Depart from me, I never knew you. Yeah. There is hypocrisy in the Baptist church. There is in the Lutheran, in the Methodist, in the Catholic. They're all the same in the sense that we all have the same need, and that need is Christ. I don't care what you call yourself. And you can call yourself evangelical, you can call yourself whatever it might be. There is many out there, and you know, maybe that can lead into what you know a lot of the other comments were regarding my false profession. Mm. I lived exactly what you're just, what you just spoke of. I would have called myself a Christian, but I lived however I wanted. I absolutely lived how I wanted. I had, you know, well, I look, had, you said you believed in Jesus, so you must have been saved, right? I mean, yeah. you were always a Christian, right? You said you believed in Jesus. Yeah. And that's, again, that's, you know, I think there's a verse that says, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Anyone can say and have head knowledge that, yeah, Jesus was a good person. Jesus was the savior. Jesus died for my sins. We can say that, but how do we know that we're believing it? How do we know that we are born again? You know, the scripture tells us you must be born again. You know, if you've not been born of the spirit, you shall not uh, see light. You shall not have life. We think of these scriptures, and how do we know? How do we truly know? Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Do you have the Spirit bearing witness 
with your own spirit, that you are a child of God. James, I can tell you, I made that profession of faith. I think I was 14, pretty sure I was 14-ish. And from 14 until I was truly converted at 23, I had no peace. I had no peace whatsoever. I could suppress it and I could enjoy my life. I really could. I could enjoy it. Um, when I'd come around Christians, which I avoided at all cost, you know, I had no desire to be around them. But when I came around them, I knew enough to know what to say. I knew that I needed to, you know, say, yeah, I, I have assurance. Yeah, I'm reading my Bible. You know, even if I read it once a month, I was fine. I wasn't really lying then, right? You know, I had all these, I had all the answers. And that's what so many people have is they have the answers, but they don't have Christ. They have no hope of glory within them. Um, 1 John 2, 3 says, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. I had a profession, but I was absolutely unable to keep his commands. I had no self-control. And I didn't want self-control. Mm. I wanted to be able to do what I wanted to do and still have heaven. You know, that's really what I wanted. I wanted in my reality of my, my thought of heaven was what my life is now, you know, all the pleasures of the world, but I didn't really want God. I didn't want Christ. I just wanted, you know, comfort, ease, all these things, but I had no no witness of the spirit. I had no love for other believers. You know, we look at first John. I had no love for other believers. I had no love for God's word. And I had no love for Christ. If any of those are missing in your life, you're probably living a lie. There's why just, do you think but why do you think people get so upset when, like in your testimony, you bring up the fact that you were a false Christian, because people hear that and they, they want to say, like I said earlier, well, no, you believed. I mean, you're saved. And it, it's like it, it's very unsettling to them for someone to say, I would have gone to hell. if I would have died at that point. Yeah. I Why does that say, upset people so much? I think it's convicting, brother. I think it's convicting because I know before I was converted, when I would look at Christians and I would see the peace they had and I would see the joy they had and I would look at them and think, I don't have what they have and I know it. But for them to tell me I don't have it, that was aggravating because even though I didn't really want it at that time, mm. I wanted what they had because I knew I was a sinner. I knew I was deserving of hell and we don't want to be told by people. You know, it's just how we are. We see it in our culture. We don't want to be told what to do. We don't want to be told the state of our soul. It's convicting and it grates against our, our own, I don't know if you call it mind or will, whatever it might be. It's just, uh, I don't know how, maybe how to explain it, James. Right. No, I, I hear you. I mean, it's kind of like when I was converted, I remember telling a relative I hadn't really been a Christian and he was very upset and angry. And yeah, the reflection I had was it did unsettle him that yeah. if it's true that I had just been saved and I was always lost. Yeah. And he's how I was when I was always lost, then that yeah. would imply he himself is lost. Yeah. And that would imply other people in the family are lost. And so that whole thought is very unsettling and yeah. Um yeah, it causes reflection and the lost man does not want to reflect on his own state of soul because it may not it may not go well. Where the right. Christian, we want to you know, we want to see sin uprooted. We want to see, you know, you know, we can even take a rebuke. We can take these things and read the scriptures for what they are because we have that new heart that is, that is seeking holiness, that is seeking Christ where before, you know, you don't, you don't want to read that because it is just like you said, it's unsettling. 
Yeah, and a lot of this just deals with the fact that people don't understand there is a true and a false conversion. Yes. And a lot of the mainstream churches, they don't ever bring up that reality that you can, as Titus 1.16 says, you can profess to know God, but deny him by your works, be yes. detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Yes. And, um, and yeah, we, we love the true gospel that we're not just forgiven, but God changes on the inside and gives us a new yeah. heart. Yeah. Amen. Well, I know um, many were encouraged uh, by what you mentioned in your testimony of your parents or even your dad specifically, not just praying for you, but you know, when your dad uh, saw you in the hospital, he said some strong things to you. Yeah. Uh, if I remember right, I think some people even thought that was bad of your father. Yeah. Which, how could they say that when you're, you yourself look at it as used of God? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but what would you, do you have anything you could encourage parents, Christian parents with in regards to uh, praying for their lost children? Yeah. Well, regarding my dad, maybe first of all, I, you know, I would encourage parents to be bold with your children, especially mm -hmm. if you get an opportunity like that. You know, we were just talking about it in prayer meeting the other night. Spurgeon says, strike when the, I strike when the iron is hot. You know, I don't, there's a lot of people right now that are shook up due to COVID or, um, you know, we had a storm here, you know, there's different things. There's different times when, when the iron is hot and we do need to strike, we need to be willing to speak, you know, bold words, um, in love, you know, and that's exactly what my father did. I mean, that was the most loving thing he could have said to me. Mm -hmm. So I thank him for that. But, um, Praying parents, yes, you're right. So many people in the comments would say things like, you know, this has this has given me, you know, renewed spirit to really pray for my children, especially grown children and their wayward or their, you know, hoping for a, a prodigal son type experience in a sense. Um, I read something recently that really encouraged me, and it was um, what they what they wanted to put across was two prayers. Pray this. Um, I don't care if you pray it morning and night. Pray it as often as you can. But two prayers. One, Father, forgive me. And two, Father, forgive them. Hmm. We ask so often, I think, Father, would you forgive our children? Would you bring our children to knowledge, a saving knowledge of Christ? Um, but I think often we need to, again, first in our own heart, pray for ourselves. Father, forgive me. Let me let me love my children. Let me um, live before them as a, as a Christian. Let my, you know, there's a scripture that says, um, let the goodness of God lead them to repentance. Let that goodness be shown even through me, you know, so that we, you know, we don't shun them. We don't push them away. We want to constantly be drawing them to ourselves. I don't care if it's inviting them for a meal, whatever it might be, but show them that you love them and then pray for them. Father, forgive them. Um, this verse, Matthew 9, 36 says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like a sheep, like sheep without a shepherd. That's what our lost children are. They're sheep without a shepherd. They're wandering. You know, they don't, they don't, they don't know the master's voice. You know, it says, my sheep hear me and they follow me. You know, we want, we want to be following the Lord. And we as a Christian hear his voice. We hear it through the scriptures. We want our children following as well. So we pray for a heart of brokenness for them. And then we pray specific scriptures over them. You know, I think it's good to just, you know, we often pray in general or pray, you know, I pray for my children in many ways. But if we can pray specific scriptures over them, and not give up on those scriptures. You know, a uh, man, sweet man, he always says, pray the scriptures to God and pray the promises of God back to him. Because what, what more, what better can, way can we pray than to pray God's word back to him? Mm -hmm. You know, if he's saying it, we ought to be saying it as well. And then don't give up. You know, I look at my life. And, uh, 
I'm so thankful for the prayers of the saints. I think of, you know, again, I could just weep when I think of, you know, the men and the women that prayed for me. Some of them I didn't even know at the time. You know, I met many later that said, you know, we've been praying for you, Luke. We've been praying for you. Hmm. I, Psalm 86, 15 says, you, O Lord, are a God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Hmm. If God was not slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, I surely would have been in hell. I lived a miserable life for many years. I was 23 years old before I was converted. You know, that's 23 years of sin just compounding upon itself. And yet he was slow to anger and merciful. And then the prayers of my parents, the prayers of these saints Hmm. in his timing, he revealed himself to me and I praise God for it. So for your children, for your parents, whoever it is you're praying for, don't give up. Don't give up. Hmm. Amen. Yeah. Well, appreciate you joining me, Luke, and going through some of these things. And um, would you close us in prayer? Absolutely. Lord, we come to you. We come to you through Christ who's opened the door. We can come boldly to the throne of grace because of the shed blood of Christ. And we thank you for that, Father. And Lord, I ask, I ask, there was so much to say here and so much was said, so much more to be said. And we say it so imperfectly. But Father, we ask that your word, as it says, would never and not return void. Father, we ask that uh, that whoever might hear this, whoever might listen to this, that they would put Luke aside, that they'd put my words aside, and that they would look to the scriptures, mm-hmm. that they would have an understanding given by you, Father. Would you open hearts? Would you set aside preconceived ideas, set aside things that, that anger us in spirit, Father, and that you'd open hearts to save Lord, I'm no different than the the most lost person that might hear this. We all have the same need, and it's a vision of Christ. Mm -hmm. It's a revelation of Christ in our soul to see that we are sinful, that we need to repent of our sin, and we need to cast it upon Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. You are worthy. You are so worthy, Lord. Yes. And we ask, we ask for mercy that we might not become misguided, that we might not set our eyes on things of the world, set our eyes on anything that is temporal, but that we might come with humble hearts and say, Lord, your will be done, not ours. Yes. Your will be done, Father, in our lives, that we might become Christ-like, whether it's suffering Whether it's comfort, it's all of you, Father, and we thank you. We'll give you the glory for it. Even as Job says, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We're here for a very short time, Father. Your word tells us life is but a vapor. And we see it. We know it. And I ask, Lord that the brevity of this life might sink in to the souls that hear this father and they might run to you. Mm-hmm. We know that you're willing to save. You're not willing that any should perish. Yes. The door is open. So father, we bless you and we thank you for your goodness to us, your kindness to us, your mercy toward us and your love within us, father. And we thank you. That even now as we give, you've given us the opportunity to give an answer for the hope that is within us. And that hope is in nothing of this world, but it's in Jesus Christ. So thank you.
We pray in your son's holy name. Amen.